Hello, and welcome to Nostalgic Medicine, where we take a look at fascinating stories about the history of medicine and healthcare. Today's video will be on the history of resuscitation. So I think you'll agree with me when I say that CPR is one of the most fascinating innovations that we have in all of medicine, because for most of human history, once your heart and lungs stopped, that was it. You were as good as dead. But ever since it was brought into mainstream medical practice in 1966, there is now hope for people who have a cardiac arrest. And CPR is actually successful about 10 to 20% of the time, based on who does it and how and where it's done. But like I said, it is only a very recent development and people have always tried to bring the dead back to life and I was curious about how it was tried in the past. So I want to show you in this video some of the strange methods of resuscitation that doctors attempted in the past and then I'll briefly talk about how a modern method of CPR developed. So cardiopulmonary resuscitation, also known as CPR, consists of three things at its most fundamental form, giving chest compressions, blowing air into the lungs, and if necessary, giving an electric shock to the heart to restart it. There's obviously way more to it like these things, but those are for the clinicians with more expertise to do. But these three things in particular have repeatedly been proven to work based on sound medical evidence. And the reason why it is so often successful is because doctors have been able to apply the understanding of how the human body works and then basically reverse that knowledge to figure out what to do when the body stops working. But here's the thing, people did not always know that the lungs expand to take in oxygen and that the heart is an electrically active muscle that pumps oxygen around the body so that should naturally lead you to asking, how did people try and bring people back to life before they had this extensive knowledge of human physiology? So like I mentioned in the intro, people have always attempted to restore life. And one of the most obvious signs to even ancient doctors that someone was dead was if they felt cold. So people tried to warm the body back up by either burning ashes on top of the person or by burying them in hot sand. And here's the interesting thing, this probably did work quite well and it's actually quite similar to what we do today to people who suffer from extreme hypothermia. Other people had different ideas and they thought that unresponsive patients were in a state that was similar to a deep sleep which they needed to be shaken awake from before it was too late. And this led to some quite violent methods being attempted to resuscitate a patient. These included slapping or even whipping the patient, splashing water on the face, tickling the throat with a feather, stretching the tongue, and waving strong salts like ammonia under the victim's nose. As barbaric as these methods do sound, these methods of physical stimulation still did manage to remain commonplace well into the 20th century. But you will be glad to hear that progress towards developing our modern form of CPR was already being made before then. And the first piece of what I like to think of as the CPR puzzle was the breathing aspect. You see, people from ancient times have known that breathing in air was vital to life in some way. And the first person who seems to have been successful with pulmonary resuscitation was the famous Dutch doctor Vesalius, who I've talked about a lot in this channel. He demonstrated that once he cut open an animal's chest, the lungs and indeed the heart stopped. But then if he used bellows to blow into the lungs, then he could eventually get them both to start working again within a few minutes. This knowledge was eventually applied to save drowning victims. As a group of scientists came together to create the Society for Recovery of Drowned Persons in 1767, which created recommendations on how to revive a drowned person. These included warming the victim up, turning them upside down to get rid of the water in the lungs and then blowing air into the lungs, either by bellows or the more well-known method of mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. 
But even though mouth to mouth is what we use today, there were still other people who were looking at other inventive methods to maintain breathing when the lung stopped. And most of these were basically attempts to mimic the motion of lung movement. Some strange examples that were used included tying someone onto a horse and then getting the horse to gallop up and down, or alternatively putting a person on top of a barrel and then rolling it backwards or forwards. And other people developed a bunch of complex chest manipulation movements. But ultimately, mouth-to-mouth -mouth and oxygen bag ventilation proved to be more effective than all of these methods, and that's why we have these today. The next key aspect of CPR to come around was defibrillation, and this came not too long after electricity was discovered in the 1700s. The start of its development came when two Swiss doctors showed that they can give ducks an electric shock, and this caused a type of cardiac arrest known as ventricular fibrillation, and then they gave them another counter shock, and this almost miraculously restarted the heart back to a normal rhythm. I guess it's up to you to decide whether this or Vesalius' experiment was a worse form of animal cruelty. But anyways, electric shocks seem to be so successful in reviving a dead heart, and this would eventually lead to the invention of the automated electrical defibrillator. And you might be surprised to hear that its initial research was funded by electric supply companies, because a lot of the linemen were dying from electrocution. Chest compressions was the last aspect to be introduced, even though it is in most people's opinion the most important aspect of CPR. And this is mainly because even though the importance of breathing has been known about for thousands of years, people only really started to understand how the heart and the circulatory system worked around the 17th century. Before then, people thought that the function of the heart was simply to warm and purify the blood. But after William Harvey, People realised that the heart is a pressure generating pump, so that meant that if you wanted to replace the function of the heart after it stops, then you had to find a way to generate pressure. And the first way that people tried to keep the heart going after cardiac arrest was by what is called an open cardiac chest massage, which involved cutting the chest open and literally using your fingers to squeeze the heart, which yes, does sound quite gross, but did work. This meant that for the longest time, people could only keep blood pumping round the body after cardiac arrest if it happened in the operating room, which don't get me wrong, did happen quite often back then, so it was a very useful innovation. But it was actually a bit of an accident that caused the invention of closed cardiac massage, or what we today know as chest compressions, and I don't think you'll be too surprised to hear that this was discovered by even more dog cruelty. This happened in 1954, when a group of doctors that were testing out defibrillation on a dog found that oddly whenever they pressed the defibrillator pads on the dog's chest, they could feel a pulse, as well as a rise in their arterial pressure, which is another way of saying that blood was flowing through the body. And these doctors were able to demonstrate that good quality chest compressions can maintain a normal blood pressure. So that's a brief look at how the three aspects of CPR got discovered, and these would be officially combined together in 1966, when the National Academy of Sciences put together the recommendations of CPR, which still is used today. This recommendation is where we get the well-known term ABC, with a D being added for definitive therapies such as drugs and defibrillation. From this point forward, the devices used for CPR have continued to develop, and most health bodies around the world now campaign for CPR to be used whenever necessary. And we also see many public health messages and television advertisements which show you how to do CPR, and this means that it's deeply in the public consciousness. And this is mainly to emphasise that anyone can and everyone should do especially the chest confessions part of CPR, 
unless otherwise stated, even if you have no medical training whatsoever. And I think that's what makes CPR in particular such a fascinating invention, as it's a way that even the average person who knows nothing about medicine can end up literally saving a life.